Hi team, Andre from High Performance Academy here. Welcome along to another one of our webinars. And in this webinar, we're going to be discussing engine coolant temperature, which I know uh, on face value doesn't sound like the most interesting topic, but it is a really important one, uh, particularly for engine reliability as well as engine performance. Uh, one of the common questions we do get asked is, what is the ideal coolant temperature range that I should be targeting or running my engine in? And it's it's a great question to know because if we run the engine too hot uh, or we run it too cold, we risk the potential for uh, reduced engine performance and potentially even damage to our engine. So obviously we want to avoid uh, both of those elements. In today's lesson, I'm going to hopefully help uh, answer some of those questions. It is a little bit tricky because as most of you can probably appreciate, there isn't really a lot of black and white when it comes to this. Uh, it's more a case of understanding the sort of likely ranges you want to be targeting and understanding what happens uh, when we get too hot, what happens when we go too cold and what we can do about each of those extremes. So I want to be really clear right here, I'm not going to give you one magic number that you must target, it is simply not that cut and dried. At the end of the lesson we will be having a Q&A session so if there is any questions that come about as part of this please feel free to ask in the chat, the team will get those through to me and we'll deal with them at the end. Uh, I will note this is probably a slightly shorter topic than what we normally deal with so we will be getting into that Q&A uh, probably a little bit quicker. Alright so coolant temperature, I mean at a high level why do we need to care about it? Well it's of course there to get rid of heat that is a byproduct of our combustion process uh, and generally if we're talking about an internal combustion engine they're only somewhere around about 35 to 40% efficient at least the sort of engines we're likely to deal with which means that the rest of the energy stored in the fuel that we're burning is going to be wasted in the form primarily of sound and heat and it's the heat that we're dealing with today. Uh, so essentially what we're trying to do with our cooling system is make sure that we can manage the heat that is being rejected from the engine and make sure that we can get that uh, basically transferred back out to the airflow around the car. So that's the, the point of the cooling system and if the cooling system is too large and too efficient or we don't have good control over it, we're going to likely find that our engine coolant temperature uh, stays too cold and we'll talk about some of the problems that that uh, can result in a little bit later. Uh, the more common situation though is that when we start modifying an engine and it makes more power or we take that more powerful engine that we've modified and we now take it out onto a racetrack, we're now using the thing under sustained high throttle operating, high, high, high throttle operation where we're producing uh, more and more power for longer periods of time, that creates more heat and usually we're going to find that the cooling system is one of the weak points and can't keep up. How that manifests itself is we start to see our coolant temperature climb. Now this can also be problematic with a factory road car because the little coolant temperature gauge uh, on the dash doesn't usually actually work that accurately. It's really only there as an indication and I mean of course every car is different but when we start tuning vehicles where we've got a, a laptop in front of us with access to the ECU software and we can actually see the specific temperature being reported by the coolant temperature sensor and we start correlating what we're seeing on the laptop screen to what the gauge is showing us, what we'll generally find is that those gauges will sit perfectly in the middle of their range anywhere from about probably 50 to 60 degrees C uh, through to about 100, 105 degrees C and then once you get up above that temperature they'll start to move quite quickly. So it doesn't really give you a really good granular understanding of what that temperature is likely to be. Uh, I will just mention as well that primarily I am going to be working in degrees C today. I've got a couple of areas where I'll transition and talk about uh, degrees C and degrees Fahrenheit but uh, primarily here in New Zealand we use the metric system and I'm not that great at converting between centigrade and Fahrenheit on the fly so I'll apologise in advance to anyone who does deal with the uh, imperial system uh, but I'm sure you can probably uh, Google and convert pretty quickly if you can't do that in your head.
So uh, what are the effects of the coolant temperature on our engine? Well, there, there's actually a number of them, some more subtle than others. Uh, obviously at the extremes, if we really cook our engine and get that coolant temperature too hot, uh, we're likely to do some very, very expensive and pretty catastrophic damage to the internal components. Uh, we can warp cylinder heads, they can end up losing uh, their hardness, they go soft basically, which means that they will no longer clamp properly to the head gasket, uh, resulting in head gasket failures. Uh, we can also bring on a situation where uh, our pistons will seize in the bores uh, because our clearances will change with temperature. So there's a whole range of things that go on here. Those are at the extreme end, uh, but a slightly more subtle element. Uh, we also see that the coolant temperature will affect our combustion efficiency, it will affect our emissions, and it will affect our engine power. So in terms of what we're focusing on in the aftermarket, generally the reliability element is probably our key driver. We really want to maintain our engine within a coolant temperature range that is going to uh, ensure that our engine remains reliable. If we look at what OE manufacturers are doing though, they actually tend to focus a little bit on those other elements, particularly emissions and particularly uh, combustion uh, performance or combustion efficiency, I should say. And uh, what we've seen over probably the last couple of decades is a lot of OEs will actually strive to increase coolant temperatures, particularly under cruise conditions to improve uh, those elements. Uh, what we also need to be very mindful of in a performance application is that as we increase our coolant temperature, uh, the knock-on effect here is that this can affect the combustion charge temperature as well. A subtle element there, but it can. Uh, basically anything that affects the combustion charge temperature, increasing it I should say, uh, will make the engine more prone to suffering from detonation and that is the biggest killer of any performance engine. So we want to be mindful of monitoring uh, that and there are ways we can deal with that and mitigate it, but we need to understand that uh, it is a problem we need to look out for. So as I mentioned, we can be operating our coolant temperature either too hot or too cold. I would say that the typical range that I see and that I'm comfortable with would generally be uh, somewhere in the region of about 80 degrees C at the low end and about 105 degrees C at the top end. Uh, in Fahrenheit, that's approximately 180 through to about 220 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, but again, it isn't that clear cut uh, and there, are, there is a wider range that can be acceptable depending on some of the specifics that I'll get into. And if we look at what some very highly developed race engines are doing, they fall well outside this range. Uh, I don't have any data because no one's likely to share from the likes of Formula One, but I did find some interesting information on NASCAR engines. And depending on the spec that these are running in and depending on the exact variant, uh, NASCAR engines are 800, 850 plus horsepower and operate at 9,000 plus RPM and do so for sustained periods of time. So uh, they are incredibly hard worked engines. Uh, so they operate uh, or at least have been operating uh, more around about 145 degrees C in terms of the coolant temp. Uh, that's about 290 degrees Fahrenheit uh, and the oil temp actually slightly higher than that. Now that is a long way above the range that I previously mentioned. Now there's some reasons that they are doing this. More importantly though there's a lot of engineering that goes into these engines to ensure that the materials that they're using, uh, the clearances inside the engines are actually up to the task of running at that temperature. But the key is why would they choose to do so? Interestingly for NASCAR one of the main reasons is actually for aerodynamic efficiency because they're running these engines so much hotter they don't need to shed as much heat and what that actually allows them to do is run a smaller cooling package and what this means then is that there's less airflow through the radiator and this reduces the aerodynamic drag of the vehicle. So a subtle element but with NASCAR being so highly developed they the teams are looking for any uh, tenth of a percent advantage they can get over the competition. Uh, probably not much of an advantage because I'm guessing every team does this, but just showing the sort of uh, range that 
uh, is potentially possible if you're developing your engine around that, as well as also understanding the uh, the implications and why. Uh, now, I also uh, will come back to aspects that are really important in our engine design, such as our piston to cylinder wall clearance, as well as our ring pack. So I've got uh, a piston here that we'll just have a quick look at under our overhead camera. So our clearance between the piston skirt and the bore, uh, this is one of our most important clearances inside the engine. The other element is uh, we can see here I've got the second ring installed on that piston. And when we are installing the rings on a performance engine, the rings will be what is referred to as a file fit piston ring. This means that they are purposely delivered slightly oversized uh, for a given bore diameter and it's our job then as the engine builder to actually measure the piston ring end gap, decide on what our optimal ring gap is for that particular engine, uh, the fuel, the application, everything else around it and then file the ring to get to our desired ring end gap. But all of these elements come down to, like, there's a, a number of factors that come into it, of course, but uh, the coolant temperature is one of them. Uh, so, for example, uh, when we are uh, boring and honing the block to get our piston to cylinder wall clearance where we want it to be, normally this is done at room temperature. Uh, however, uh, what we do find is that as the engine heats up to operating temperature, uh, the bores will change in size. Obviously, the materials do expand. There's a thermal uh, expansion coefficient with all of the materials. So we know that that's going to expand. That's fine because our piston manufacturers give us specifications to suit setting our clearances at normal room temperature. However, another subtle element with this is that quite often as the uh, bores come up to operating temperature, uh, they will move or distort a little bit compared to what we we're measuring at room temperature. Long and short of this is that if we bore and hone the cylinder at room temperature and we have everything perfect, we've got our clearance exactly where we need it to be, uh, we know that our bores are perfectly round, there's no out of round going on, there's no belling or taper from the top of the bore to the bottom, chances are that when that, that bore is at operating temperature, uh, all of those elements will move slightly. So an element that is used by a lot of race engine builders is what's called hot honing, which is where they actually flow fluid uh, at operating temperature through the water jacket of the engine and then they bore and hone the block at a hot operating temperature. The idea here is that we're getting a truer bore finish, uh, a truer bore that is round and straight at the actual or under the actual conditions that the engine is going to operate in. Uh, now, uh, without getting too deep into uh, the elements of uh, boring and honing a block because I am not an engine machinist, one element if you are using a hot hone is that the target clearance will understandably be dramatically different to what we see at room temperature. So there's a bit to learn here. The reason I'm going down this path is that hopefully from that you can understand that while there are other elements uh, that will affect our, our desired clearance range, the coolant temperature would also be one of those. And particularly with the NASCAR, I can only uh, assume that the engine builders will be adjusting their clearances to suit that sort of operating uh, range. Uh, so what are the other advantages with running the coolant temperature hotter? Uh, so frictional losses do decrease at higher operating temperatures. Now that again is difficult to say as a blanket statement because there are some other elements at play in here as well. Uh, some of this comes down to the oil selected and how that works at that desired operating temperature as well. But uh, to keep things nice and simple, there can potentially be a small decrease in our frictional losses uh, if we run a higher operating temperature for our coolant. So again, this comes into why some of the OE manufacturers are choosing to specifically specifically target higher coolant temperatures. If we look at uh, older cars from maybe the 80s and 90s, uh, a pretty typical operating temperature for the thermostat would be around about 82 degrees C, uh, again around about 180 degrees Fahrenheit, and that would be the temperature where the mechanical thermostat would physically open and start flowing uh, water, 
through the cooling system. So the idea there is it should be maintaining somewhere around about that 82 degrees C. Uh, more modern vehicles, particularly ones fitted with electronically controlled thermostats, where the ECU can also map the target temperature uh, air temperature range that the, the manufacturer wants to run in. Uh, it's not uncommon to see uh, cruise coolant temperatures uh, in the 95 plus degree C vicinity. So you can see things have changed there. And again, uh, that is one of the reasons for that. Uh, the other element here is thermal losses inside of the engine. Uh, so obviously we've got our combustion temperature inside the cylinder. Uh, the cylinder wall and then the water jacket is, is going to be cooler and this creates what's referred to as a thermal gradient. Uh, so the larger that thermal gradient, in other words, the larger the difference between our combustion charge temperature and our coolant temperature, the more heat transfer we will get from one to the other. Uh, the disadvantage of this is that this does lead to some losses and basically it reduces the thermal energy that is available during combustion to be converted into work. So that's another benefit of running things uh, a little bit hotter on purpose. But the biggest thing for me is that this does lead to a higher propensity for the engine suffering from knock, which we need to absolutely avoid. So there are limits to this, and what I'd consider is safe for an OE manufacturer targeting uh, reduced emissions and uh, better fuel economy, uh, more thermal efficiency, maybe doesn't always go hand in hand with what we want for a dedicated race engine. Uh, another element that we do need to consider with our coolant temperature is making sure that the coolant doesn't boil. And this is one that it's not very complicated, but it is easy to overlook if you haven't really thought about this or got a real basic understanding of some of the physics going on here. Uh, most of us would understand that water boils at uh, 100 degrees C uh, at atmospheric pressure, one atmosphere of pressure. Uh, think off the top of my head, that's about 212 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, or if we, however, increase that, double the air pressure to two atmospheres, uh, that actually brings our water boiling temperature up to 120 degrees C, uh, which is almost 250 degrees Fahrenheit. And if we jump across to my laptop screen, uh, this is the sort of graph of, of how uh, the boiling temperature of water relates to our pressure. This is important because if we didn't have a sealed cooling system with a radiator cap that allowed the pressure to increase, uh, we'd basically have to make sure that our engine uh, coolant temperature never exceeded 100 degrees C, otherwise it would boil. Downside with our water boiling is that we end up creating steam. These steam pockets do a really, really good job of insulating uh, the material that they're contacting, uh, probably most likely around the combustion chamber uh, in the cylinder head, and this dramatically reduces the heat transfer. So what it does is very, very quickly leads to the coolant temperatures or the engine uh, operating temperature spiraling out of control. So we've got to make sure that uh, basically irrespective of anything else, our coolant doesn't boil. And particularly for a racing application, uh, we may look at increasing the cap pressure, the radiator cap pressure, that maintains that pressure in the cooling system and therefore increases the boiling temperature. Uh, there are also other elements to consider here as well because uh, when we uh, add in uh, an antifreeze, it would be that ethyl glycol uh, or maybe some of the more performance orientated uh, antifreeze or corrosion inhibitors. These also have the effect of increasing uh, the boiling point of the fluid. Uh, there's some downsides with that as well though that are worth diving into briefly. So uh, for example, uh, water on its own, just clean fresh water, uh, actually does a, a much better job of transferring heat from the material it's contacting, the cylinder wall or the combustion chamber, uh, than when we start adding in uh, a glycol-based co uh, antifreeze that actually dramatically reduces the heat transfer. So yes, we're stopping the uh, water from boiling, the coolant from boiling, we're stopping it from freezing, and we're stopping it from corroding, all great things, and we do need some of the those properties but it does come at the cost of the ability of that fluid to transfer heat away from the hot material. Uh, so this is why we start seeing some of the uh, 
products out there like waterless coolants, which are designed with the properties that we need uh, for anti-corrosion, anti-freeze, etc. Uh, but they are still designed for very, very good heat transfer properties. Uh, another element with uh, glycol-based antifreeze is that uh, they are really slippery. So you actually find that a lot of racing classes uh, specifically outlaw the use of uh, glycol-based coolants in the cooling system because if you do have a cooling system failure or it leaks out onto the track, it can potentially be quite uh, dangerous for other people. Um, the other element we do need to consider I don't have the number in front of me. The NASCAR uh, engines that I talked about before, running at uh, sort of 140 odd degrees C, uh, they run at several atmospheres of pressure. So very, very high pressures. And this in and of itself creates another problem because most conventional motorsport based or OE based radiators uh, would simply blow apart at those sort of pressures. So this already comes down to the whole uh, engine and all of the cooling system need to be designed with the end result in mind, otherwise you're likely to have uh, problems. Uh, now, in terms of targeting specifically higher coolant temperatures like NASCAR or like some of these OE manufacturers, we do need to understand that the material suitability and reliability uh, comes into play here at these higher coolant temperatures. And what I mean by this is that a lot of the materials that we conventionally see uh, probably aren't that well suited to vastly elevated temperatures, uh, specifically cylinder heads and blocks when they're made out of alloy. Uh, alloy cylinder heads will anneal uh, at around about 350 degrees C. Now, obviously, we're not advocating getting our coolant temperature up to that, but you've got to also understand that we're monitoring the coolant temperature, but uh, on the other side of the combustion chamber and the cylinder head, uh, we've got much, much higher temperatures uh, presented as uh, as a result of the combustion process. So we're, we're not able to directly correlate our coolant temperature necessarily to the surface temperature of that alloy material on the inside of the, the combustion chamber, but uh, one could probably understand it's going to be significantly hotter. Uh, so once we get to that point where uh, the 350C in this case, uh, we're going to start seeing the material soften significantly, and uh, that's going to actually start happening, it'll anneal around about 350C, sorry I'll just get my facts straight here, uh, but it'll actually start to soften from as low as about 280, 290 degrees C and that's when we start sort of losing the mechanical properties of the material that are so important for uh, head gasket sealing and making sure that the uh, the cylinder head remains uh, straight and, and true. So obviously uh, if you were going to target much higher temperatures that might require a different alloy being used that is uh, dimensionally stronger and going to maintain or going to withstand those higher temperatures reliably. Um, now I wanted to dive into clearances, I've already mentioned these briefly, so obviously these do depend on the uh, the operating temperature. Now if we run the engine too cold, most people sort of think that if the engine's too cold, well it's at least safe and I mean to a degree it is but there are some downsides with this as well and uh, a lot of uh, people will run uh, with a cooling system that is excessive for use for the application and make uh, um, things a little bit worse by then removing the thermostat out of the system and what this results in is overcooling or the potential for overcooling of the engine. And again, just coming back to my statement about the uh, temperature gauges, if you don't have a digital readout from maybe an aftermarket dash or your ECU of what the coolant temperature is, uh, you're likely to still find that the factory gauge will sit nice, nice and central in the middle of the range, but your actual coolant temperature might be down in the, in the 50 degree range. And at that point, what we're going to end up with is essentially excessive uh, cylinder wall to piston wall clearances, so again that's the clearance between the side of our piston skirt and the cylinder wall. Uh, this can result in a few potential problems, none of them in and of themselves necessarily are uh, tragically detrimental but not what we want. Uh, what we're going to end up with with the excessive clearances or increased clearances is additional blow-by 
Uh, so that's our combustion pressure escaping down past the rings into the sump. Your engine's going to be breathing heavier. This will also uh, potentially put more contaminants into the oil. Uh, we're also going to end up with a piston uh, more prone to rocking. And this is particularly uh, an issue with a forged piston like this one here. Uh, forged pistons do expand more as they come up to operating temperature than a cast piston. So uh, typically we set the piston to cylinder wall clearance uh, a little bit more, a little wider with a forged piston. So uh, if the engine isn't operating at a normal reasonable temperature, what we can end up with is what's called piston rock. And you can hear this with a forged engine when it's cold, uh, if the clearances are excessive, and it sounds like a rattling sound. So basically uh, the piston isn't supported properly and it can rock side to side. Uh, this can result in premature wear to the piston skirt. Uh, it can also kind of exacerbate the problem with blow by because as the piston rocks that can uh, be detrimental to the ring seal so we end up with an increase again in our blow by so uh, nothing really that we want to see going on there uh, but again not necessarily something that's going to instantaneously result in a dramatic or catastrophic engine failure just probably more wear over time another element that's easy to overlook though is that uh, if you are consistently you're running your engine that cold, let's say just 50 degrees C as an example, uh, you'd almost certainly be dropping back into some level of coolant enrichment or warm-up enrichment, which means that we're simply going to be adding additional fuel that would be necessary during warm-up, but under these conditions is just essentially creating an overly rich air-fuel ratio that we don't need that's going to be detrimental to fuel consumption and it's also going to end up hurting our power. Uh, so again, all of these things can happen if you're not actually aware that your coolant temperature is too low. Uh, hotter temperatures, uh, obviously as I was kind of mentioned, these are a little bit more dramatic uh, and in terms of our clearances, and again, it's not just driven by our coolant temperature. Uh, there's a lot more that goes into this that will also drive what our clearances end up being. Uh, but we can end up with our piston expanding to the point where uh, it actually seizes in the bore. And when that happens, it's generally going to be a catastrophic failure. Uh, the conrod will generally pull uh, the pin boss out of the piston and then basically uh, throw whatever is left out the side of the block. So there's not usually a lot left of that. Uh, likewise, our uh, rings can end up expanding to the point where the ring ends actually butt together. Now, when they do that, there's nowhere left for them to continue expanding except out or outways. And uh, when that happens again, the ring will season the bore, rip the crown off the piston, and we kind of get the same result. So, uh, nothing good is going to come from that. So how do we achieve uh, a uh, desired target temperature range, which we'll jump into what that range is likely to be uh, shortly. Uh, first of these is radiator sizing. So uh, most people would think that the factory radiator would have a fair bit of headroom in it, but uh, often that's not really the case. Uh, kind of for the same efficiency reasons as I mentioned with NASCAR, OE manufacturers don't really want to put an excessively large radiator in a car uh, and I would expect, not having worked for an OE manufacturer, that they will probably size the radiator and cooling system to suit the hottest market that the vehicle is going to run in and give a little bit of, of buffer or headroom in there uh, just to cover a worst case scenario. But when we take that same car that's a pedestrian road car, maybe modify it so it's got another 20% more power, which means we're now introducing more heat into the cooling system. And then we take it onto a racetrack and we beat on it hard lap after lap for 15 or 20 minutes. It's very easy to exceed the capability of that factory cooling system. So this often can require us to uh, think about the size of the radiator and up spec that. But radiator sizing is not just a case of bigger is better. There's actually a lot of science that goes into radiators and uh, particularly the design of the fins and the passes through the radiator have a really big impact on how efficiently the radiator will be able to uh, get rid of heat that is in that coolant. Uh, in this instance, I am definitely not a specialist on this area. I would 
suggest that you talk to a specialist radiator supplier who can run through the calculations for you. Uh, PWR would be one that jumps to mind, CSF uh, in the US, and they will be able to size something and provide a core design that's going to suit your application and make sure that you've at least got a, a radiator in the vehicle that's capable of handling uh, the temperature that it's going to need to reject. Uh, also worth talking about thermostats uh, or blocking plates, blanking plates. Um, I'm not really opposed to thermostats. A lot of people, as a rule of thumb, throw them in the bin for any competition car. Um, if they're working properly, I see absolutely no problem with a thermostat. Uh, if we are running a thermostat, understand that they are available in different ranges. And uh, if you've got a factory delivered car that's maybe running an 88 or a 90 degree C thermostat, then for competition purposes, if you can get access to a 78 or an 80 degree C thermostat, this can be beneficial. Important to understand though that the cooling system is only going to be able to achieve that target if it has enough thermal capacity to, to do so. So, you know, if you've got a tiny little radiator that's woefully undersized for the, for the amount of uh, heat that it, you are trying to put through it, then it really doesn't matter what radiator, sorry, what thermostat you fit, it's not going to be able to get you down to that temperature. So all of these elements work hand in hand. Uh, the other common approach, though, with uh, a race car is to remove the thermostat entirely if you're going to do that, it is common practice though to fit a restrictor plate uh, because if you just simply take the thermostat out of the system, uh, what we can end up finding is that the water actually flows too fast through the system and it won't build pressure uh, inside the cylinder head and the engine block. So typically uh, we'll run a restrictor plate with a 3 quarter inch or 19 mil hole. That seems to work pretty well but a little bit of experimentation may be required. Um, also worth understanding that there is a relationship between your engine coolant temperature and your engine oil temperature. Uh, both are actually doing the same job uh, of removing heat from the internal components. Obviously the oil has some other pretty important uh, tasks while it's inside the engine as well. What I'm getting at here though is if you've got an engine where you are struggling to maintain uh, coolant temperature, uh, first of all, really good idea to at least monitor the engine oil temperature. You can quite often get a bit of a shock at what that's running at. And I know that not every club day car is going to go to the trouble of fitting uh, an oil temperature sensor to the sump or something of that nature. It can be quite a big job to do so. Uh, in the past, I have used a simple uh, digital voltmeter with a temperature sensor uh, K-type thermocouple probe. And I've just put that down the dipstick tube after I've come back into the pits and that will give you a really good idea of what uh, the oil temperature is doing. Uh, so obviously if your oil temperature is starting to get too high uh, then adding a cooler uh, is going to be a good way of getting heat out of that which as a knock-on effect will also help uh, your coolant temperature. Uh, last part of this, fans. Uh, a lot of people think that radiator fans are going to be the cure for an engine that is overheating. Uh, what's easy to miss is that the fans are almost completely ineffective at racing speed uh, to the point where you'll find that a lot of professionally built race cars don't actually include uh, electric thermo fans of any type and the reason for this is that it helps them reduce weight uh, and obviously as I mentioned they, they really don't do anything at uh, racing racing speed. Uh, the other hand, in the pits, yes, absolutely, when the car is stationary, particularly when you've come in uh, from a track session and all of a sudden you are at a stop, at that point fans will be uh, really important to ha help maintain that temperature. Uh, cars, race cars without fans, you'll quite often see them plug in an external fan unit into the front of the, the front bar when the car is in the pits. You see Formula One cars, they do the same. They've got little blower fans that they place uh, onto the radiator inlets for that purpose uh, so that they've got airflow through when the car is stationary. But yeah, do not think that your fans are going to be a, a cure-all uh, out on the racetrack. Once you're above probably about 20 or 30 miles an hour, the fans are really going to do absolutely nothing for you. All right, so 
onto the crux of all of this, what is this ideal uh, range that we should be aiming for? And my own personal recommendation here is ideally, uh, I'd like to see the coolant temperature in the range of 80 to 90 degrees C. That's kind of my, my real sweet spot. That would be absolutely perfect if I could maintain that. Sometimes that is uh, pretty unlikely and a wider range that I'm still perfectly comfortable with is 70 degrees C up to about 100 degrees C. I don't really like to see my water temperature go much above about 100 degrees C and I'll show you in a second uh, some of the safety protocols I put into place with our 862 uh, to sort of add engine protection once we go above about 105. Uh, below 70, if, if we're just not there, we'll that's actually a much easier problem to solve. Uh, if we're using an electric water pump, then you can look at pulse width modulating that or pulsing it on and off to reduce the flow and allow the system to build more heat. Uh, or you can use blanking plates to partially blank some of the airflow into the radiator, uh, reducing the effectiveness of the radiator to get you into the ballpark as well. Uh, now we're going to jump into some questions really shortly, so good time if you do have any questions to ask those. Uh, before we jump into those, let's just head across to uh, my laptop screen at the moment uh, and I'll show you through the engine protection I'm using in our 8.6. This is in the Motec M1, it probably looks a little bit more complex than some systems if you're not used to it, but don't worry about the intricacies of it, the two elements that I want to show you are really, really simple. So at the moment I am looking at the boost control tab and what we've got here uh, I think this is it uh, this is our sort of target uh, boost pressure versus RPM and throttle position uh, this is maximum I can pull it back from this on a dial so you can see that uh, at uh, wide open throttle and higher RPM we're targeting 170 kPa 1.7 bar of positive boost which is uh, around about 25 psi if you work in psi all right so that's our maximum and that's if everything's running properly but we do have the ability to bring in some uh, boost limits and warnings and uh, if we just uh, scroll down through here our uh, coolant temperature boost limit is the one I wanted to talk about so let's click on that and we'll expand that out so here we've got a two-dimensional table relative to our coolant temperature and basically values of 100% just mean that we'll be operating off that maximum table that we just looked at. So we'll have all of the available boost uh, and then as we move from 105 and above you can see that I'm starting to drop that down. Uh, 110 degrees C, I'm at 80. I don't really want that engine operating above 110 at all. So you can see that once we get up to 115 we're, we're really dramatically dropping that in half essentially. So so that's one element, the car is, is just simply going to lose uh, some pace because it's pulling all of the boost out of it. That will potentially or hopefully the aim here is that as we reduce the boost, we're reducing the power that the engine is going to be producing, hence we're putting less heat into the cooling system and that in and of itself is going to help bring those temperatures back down. Now other than the fact that the car is going to start feeling a, a little bit sluggish to the driver, this shouldn't be too overbearing at least not until we get up above about 110C. Uh, so it's kind of fairly subtle. Uh, another one that's uh, a little bit more overbearing, a little bit harder to miss is what I'm doing with my engine speed limit. So uh, that's on our engine speed limits tab here. Uh, again, a bit going on, but all I really wanted to show you here is the additional engine speed limits. And uh, let's just full screen that. So we're only looking at that. And uh, here we've got our rev limit versus our coolant temperature, again simple 2D table, uh, up to 105 degrees, uh, 9000 RPM. That's actually not our maximum, there is an overall maximum RPM limit which depending on the event I'll normally have set at about uh, 8500. Uh, I do this just to make sure that with all of these additional limits they're not going to come into play when I don't want them. So I basically set the normal limit well outside the range that uh, I'm happy with or going to, uh, going to want and then the uh, ECU will use the maximum limit which is lower than these under normal conditions. But then once we get up to 110, uh, we're at 8200, 
uh, and then 111, you can see I've got a break point there that's quite sharp. So up to 110, it'll still allow me to rev out to 8200. As soon as we go above 110, uh, straight away we're down to 6000 RPM. So that is probably above the engine's normal operating rev range. So with a, a close ratio six speed sequential paddle shifted gearbox, if I'm changing it, uh, let's say 8400 RPM, uh, it's probably only dropping down to maybe six and a half. Uh, 6, 4, 6, 2, somewhere there like that depending on uh, exactly which gear I'm changing from. So you're not going to miss that. It's going to be very obvious to the driver and it's going to straight away pinpoint you've got a problem. Of course I'm going to be using this in conjunction with uh, warnings on the dash, if we've got a digital dash, to tell the, the driver, hey, something's wrong. And this really again comes down to personal preference and understanding uh, what's going on and what you're trying to protect. Uh, if you've got, uh, if you're doing this for yourself, well, obviously you're going to have a bit of a uh, better understanding of what's going on. If you're trying to protect a car that you're tuning for a customer, you're doing this commercially. Uh, it can be a good idea to incorporate these things because a lot of uh, customers maybe don't have the mechanical sympathy that an engine that's highly tuned does require. So this kind of enforces that mechanical sympathy. But you definitely want to explain to the customer what you're doing so that if the engine does get hot and all of a sudden it starts uh, misfiring, it's actually not misfiring, it's uh, just because that engine protection rev limiter has come in, they're going to understand what's going on. Right, so that's a couple of the protection strategies. There are a range of others as well. We can start targeting richer air fuel ratios. We could also pull ignition timing out because, as I've mentioned, one of the biggest concerns with running excessive uh, engine coolant temperature is it does make the engine more prone to suffering from knock, and that will very quickly destroy your engine. Uh, you can test a little bit of this on the dyno as well, just for your own interest's sake. Uh, run the engine at a normal operating temperature, let's say 80 to 90 degrees C and get the ignition timing dialed in and at a point where it is not suffering from knock. And once you're happy with that, uh, what you can do is see how the engine responds to higher coolant temperatures simply by blanking the radiator and try and get it up another 10 degrees, maybe to 100 or something of that nature and just see if the engine does start to become more prone to knock, uh, particularly if you're dealing with a turbocharged engine uh, on pump gas with a relatively poor octane rating, uh, it almost certainly will, in which case you can start using some engine protection strategies there to start pulling timing out at higher coolant temperatures and higher loads if you want. There's really uh, a, a number of, of uh, areas you can explore depending on how complex you want to get with this. Uh, right, well, oh, just let me get back to my notes for a second. Um, I did or I already talked about coolants a, a little bit in terms of uh, water being really, really good at uh, heat transfer. Uh, water with glycol is uh, is not as good, uh, about 20% worse depending on your, your premix of uh, water to glycol, about 20% worse in terms of heat transfer uh, than water on its own. Uh, then there's the water wetter style products. What you do need to be careful of if you are uh, running just plain water, as I mentioned already, is uh, there is no freeze in inhibitors in them. So if you do live in a cold climate uh, where you are likely to get down below the freezing temperature of water, uh, that can very, very quickly destroy an expensive engine. So you don't want that. Uh, but also the corrosion inhib inhibitors are really important. So make sure that you use some kind of additive there. Right, we'll get into our questions now. Um, Gareth has asked a really good question that I don't have data to answer. What range of delta temperature, uh, and he's talking here, inlet versus outlet, would you consider good? Yeah, I do not have an answer for that, Gareth. I have not been in a situation uh, where I've been able to monitor both the inlet and outlet temperature of the uh, radiator, unfortunately. So yeah, great question, but one that I can't actually uh, help you out with. Uh, obviously, monitoring the actual coolant temperature inside the engine, wherever the factory temperature sensor is, that's the most important thing because that's the temperature that the engine, is, engine components are actually being exposed to. 
Uh, so that kind of becomes uh, essentially a knock-on effect from how efficiently, how how well that radiator is working. But what you're talking about there, that delta temperature, uh, I would suggest gives you a pretty good indication of uh, the ability of the radiator to get rid of that heat. Uh, Eric Vaughan's asked, how would you control overcooling? Hopefully I did answer this inside of the, the webinar, but uh, uh, thermostat, if you haven't, if you've removed a thermostat, uh, a restrictor plate if you really don't want to run a thermostat, uh, and then you can start using blanking plates in front of the radiator. Uh, so this would be quite common in a lot of race classes where the cooling system is essentially sized uh, to deal with the worst possible conditions, heat of summer, maybe 35 degrees C day, uh, sitting behind a car in traffic with limited air flow so they've sized the radiator to cope with that worst case scenario and then of course if you run that car under cooler conditions maybe autumn or winter it's almost certainly going to overcool so that's when you can uh, use blanking plates I mean worst case scenario if you really get stuck uh, you could just use race tape to blank off uh, some of the airflow into the radiator. Uh, a little bit of caution with that and a little bit of testing to see how that actually responds to get you into that sort of uh, sweet range that you want. Now that's another element that is worth mentioning here, uh, particularly for uh, road race style competition cars. Uh, a little bit of driver sort of awareness does come into this. So for example, even with a, a reasonably well-sized cooling system that works perfectly uh, on under a qualif qualifying lap where you don't have other traffic around you. If you're battling hard with other cars and you're sitting right in the slipstream of a car in front, that is going to dramatically reduce the airflow into that radiator. So that's why you'll quite often see drivers that have been uh, sitting in traffic for a, for a few laps will actually purposely jump out of the traffic, out of that slipstream, down a long straight to get fresh airflow into the radiator. So these are some of the little tricks that the driver can use to help uh, keep the coolant under control. Uh, next question comes from Ben who's asked, uh, K20 NA tuned on a dyno 88 degrees C. Uh, turns out was miscalibrated, so actually running 11 degrees C higher. The calibration is fixed now, but what impact will it have had on the tune that should be re-looked at? Okay, uh, probably under those conditions, little to none. Uh, it would be very unlikely uh, if you were running at 88 degrees or uh, 99 degrees, you're 11 degrees hotter, uh, that you would be in any kind of warm-up enrichment. It would be very unusual to have any additional enrichment within that range. Uh, by all means, check. Uh, but that would be the only thing that immediately jumps to mind. Uh, another element which should be subtle, quite often you'll find a, a lot of ECUs use a charge temperature estimate table and without diving too deeply into that uh, what that does is instead of just using intake air temperature to estimate the charge temperature charge temperature is the important thing that's the temperature of the air charge as it goes past the valves into the combustion chamber which is what we care about uh, the charge temperature approximation or estimate table uses both coolant temperature and intake air temperature and it biases between the two depending on the airflow principle being that at very low airflows idle and cruise, the airspeed is so slow that the charge temperature will increase based on the coolant temperature. Basically it's drawing heat out of the intake ports, the cylinder head, etc. and the inlet manifold on its way into the engine. At wide open throttle, 8000 RPM, uh, not enough time for that to happen so we bias more towards the intake air temperature. If you are using that sort of a system uh, then yeah that could affect your charge temperature estimate. I would imagine that you'd be talking uh, a few percent at the most, so I, I doubt it would be something that would be significant. Uh, but if I've got my numbers around the right way, 99 degrees C is pretty hot for a naturally aspirated K20. I would be looking at ways to get that down a little bit. Uh, Brian has asked, are you an advocate for fan shrouds versus none? Do you believe that they play a role in fan cooling? Uh, you know what, Brian? I haven't actually had the opportunity to do back-to-backs on this. Uh, I've run both with and without fan, fan shrouds, uh, and I, I think 
there's levels to what we call a fan shroud as well. So if we're talking about the a viscous fan that's driven by the engine with a big plastic shroud around the, the fan and the radiator, uh, absolutely I, I consider those to be an essential because otherwise you've kind of just got this fan hanging out in the middle of space and uh, the chance of it doing its job efficiently is pretty limited. But if we're talking a, a electric fan and putting one just directly on the back of the radiator, which would be the norm, versus a proper maybe an alloy shroud that the fans then bolt to. Uh, yeah, I think it's probably safe to say that the alloy shroud will improve things, but I, again, I haven't done a back-to-back -back, uh, to be able to actually prove that, sorry. Uh, Nathan has asked, is it worth opening an alloy radiator to create a two-pass setup or just get one size correctly? I'm tight on space uh, with a Street Exocet kit car, MX-5 MB radiator running an LS1. Uh, yeah, okay, so radiator design, Nathan, absolutely is not my forte, so I could not really give you uh, a, a good guide on that. As I mentioned in the webinar, I'd probably be talking to uh, companies that specialise in uh, radiator construction and, and get their input on it. There is a lot that goes into this, and again, I'm, I'm just not the one to be talking about that. Uh, sorry. Uh, next question, expansion tank versus a swirl tank. A number of new cars will use a pressurised expansion tank as a fill point. Have you seen this as a common practice for uh, more fit for purpose race car cooling system? Swirl tanks aim to swirl the hot site coolant at a high point of the system to help any air escape. Have you seen this used often? Uh, what's the 86 run and have you ever tested power versus engine temperature on the dyno? Okay, a bunch of questions there. Uh, so to answer your last question first because it's nice and easy. Uh, yeah, I have done some testing on engine temperature uh, versus power and uh, within sort of a, a reasonable range and I'd say maybe sort of 20 to 30 degrees C I, I haven't really seen uh, a dramatic difference in engine power. Uh, what I see more the engine is much more sensitive to is our oil temperature uh, particularly our K20 powered Honda uh, basically until we get the oil temperature up above 100 degrees C the thing's just an absolute slug so uh, again I can't say that that goes for every engine but uh, the FA20 powered Toyota 86s are another one which are really sensitive to oil temperature uh, the other one would be inlet air temperature so those would take my precedent over uh, engine coolant temperature but obviously as we start going massively outside of that normal range, yeah absolutely I would start to see that affecting uh, the engine performance. Uh, swirl tanks, so <sighs> swirl tanks generally used as a way as you've mentioned of uh, evacuating uh, chance of, of air pockets, steam etc uh, out of the system and get air out of that system, particularly if you've got multiple bleed points. RB26 would be a good example where quite often additional uh, air bleeds are added into the cylinder head. Uh, yeah, really good way of making sure that you don't have uh, air pockets or bubbles going through that cooling system. Um, expansion tank is a full point. I mean, I've done just about anything and everything or seen it involved in cars that I've tuned. Um, you know, if it's well designed, it's going to work. I don't say that you absolutely need an expansion, uh, a swirl pot uh, with our. Uh, SR86, uh, we have a remote mounted expansion tank which is our fill point, um, that's worked really well, I don't quite know what more I can expand on that question with, sorry. Uh, next question from Ignacio I think it is, uh, my BMW N20 engine runs at 115C when in Eco Pro mode and 1995 in Sport, uh, what's the advantage the first time I saw the temperature I thought it was broken, uh, what I meant is why is Eco Pro targeting a higher t coolant temperature and higher engine coolant temperature increases mile per gallon. Okay so this is kind of what I was referring to and I used the BMW example because I've had personal experience with this, uh, they do use that electronic thermostat to purposely run a higher coolant temperature. I don't think I've seen 115C but I haven't spent a huge amount of time working on or tuning BMWs but uh, essentially it's everything I was talking about, There's the improved uh, thermal efficiency, uh, there is the reduction of frictional losses so generally the engine will be slightly more efficient uh, when you're in that Eco Pro mode uh, but probably not as, as well set up for uh, production of maximum power. Uh, I'm not sure if you've said 
your higher engine coolant temperature increases miles mile per gallon because definitely at cruise that absolutely should not be the case. That's why after all these OEs do that. Uh, Kyle has asked, is it common practice to run dedicated drag cars at a lower temperature uh, due to not always having time to bring the vehicle up to temp? Um, I mean, I can only speak from my own personal experience and I've run uh, drag cars with and without cooling systems. Uh, I wouldn't have said that I tried to target necessarily uh, a very low temperature, uh, but particularly with cars where we've got a, a closed in front with no actual airflow to the radiator or uh, no radiator at all. In my own drag car, we had a solid fill block and we just circulated water through the cylinder head, but there was no radiator. Uh, I would try and start the run, or maybe not start the run, start uh, the process. When I started the, the car up to drive into stage, uh, I would try and be targeting somewhere around about 70 degrees C. A reason for that is uh, obviously I've got no way of the, the coolant temperature coming down and if someone wanted to hang me out to dry on the lights or something or mess around or something else went wrong, it just gave me a little bit more headroom uh, before I was sort of got to a point where I wasn't comfortable with the temperature uh, and it was too hot and I had to abort the run. Um, Next question from uh, Wedge is asked, uh, thoughts on using a cylinder head temperature sensor instead of a coolant temperature sensor? Um, yeah, I mean, that, that's the way air-cooled engines often work. Uh, basically, a uh, temperature sensor that goes under one of the head bolts or something similar. Um, I mean, if you do run uh, a, a water-cooled engine, then directly measuring a coolant temperature is, is probably still a, a much more efficient and effective way of doing that, though. Um, JD Tuning, uh, is a 0 to 150 PSI uh, temp sensor good for coolant temperature and pressure combined sensor uh, or is that too much of a pressure range? Uh, yeah, if you're getting up to 150 psi, uh, you've got a few problems on your hands there. Uh, so it's it's way more range than you would need, but it's absolutely going to be fine. Uh, the resolution of of most decent loggers, dashes, and ECUs uh, is going to give you a, an absolutely uh, fine range with that zero to 150 psi sensor. So yeah, uh, not a problem at all. Um, uh, Predix has asked any differences in regard to diesel applications compared to gas spark ignition considering diesel doesn't suffer, suffer from knock uh, I am not really the right person to be talking about performance diesel at that level I do not have enough runs on the board with that sort of engine to really speak to that uh, uh, with any authority what I would say is that everything I talked about in terms of ring end gap uh, piston cylinder wall clearance uh, and material reliability still would absolutely hold true for the diesel albeit uh, these engines are generally uh, built much much stronger than a conventional gasoline engine in the first place uh, right, I think that has got us to the end there of the questions. Some great ones in there. Uh, and for a simple topic, I'm um, pretty impressed with the number of questions we got. So thanks to everyone who has watched. Thanks for everyone who has been asking those questions. And hopefully you've got a better understanding of uh, the sort of range of coolant temperatures that we should be targeting. But more importantly, a bit of an understanding of, of what the implications of running the engine outside of those ideal ranges is likely to be. As usual, if you are watching this as an HPA member in our webinar archive at a later point, if you've got any further questions, please ask those in the forum and I'll be happy to answer them there. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time. That was just a taste of what we put on every week for our HPA Gold members. Our Gold members are able to watch these live and ask questions and get answers while we're presenting. After the webinars have been hosted live, they're added into our webinar archive where our Gold members can re-watch them at their leisure. We've currently got over 240 hours of existing webinar content covering topics on engine building, engine tuning and wiring. This is one of the fastest ways to expand your knowledge on a wide range of topics as well as to stay up to date with the latest tools, trends and techniques in the performance industry. Our Gold members also get access to our private members only forum which is the best place to get fast answers to your specific questions. Gold membership can be purchased for just 19 US dollars per month. However, you'll also receive three months of free access with the purchase of any of our courses. Click the link in the description to learn more.